This is tuna on toast. La 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 red leather, yellow leather, red leather, yep. What are you doing? Pardon me. I'm getting my voice ready for Mikey for make you Ah, there he is right now. Let's go see him. I love that he gave the rhythm knock. Who is it? Yeah, Mike! Welcome! How are you? Thank you for being here. Of course. Oh my god. Good to see you. Great to see you too. Look who's here. Mikey, please have a seat right here. With my non uh, non khaki jumpsuit. Yes, if you're not, this is not where we do the episode. But before we get going, we're gonna do a little movie trivia here. Okay. I think if, of all musicians, you know more movie lines than anybody. You think so? I think you're up there. I'm very flattered by that. Okay, here we go. A little bell and yeah, everything? Of course. <laughs> I'm hoping the tune on toast leads to me getting the game show. <laughs> I, I, and I hope that I don't let everybody down by being the most like accomplished movie liner in rock music. No, oh, you're good. All right, all right. Just take, take your breath. Um, okay, here we go. Don't mess with the bull, young man. You'll get the horns. That's an easy one. That's a breakfast club. That's Vernon. The question isn't, what are we going to do? The question is, what aren't we going to do? In the theme of John Hughes, it's Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Of course. Oh my God. Kids, at age 12, I weighed 319 pounds. I had bad skin, low self-esteem, and no self-respect. Now I eat success for breakfast with skim milk. Ooh, I don't know that one. Heavyweights. Okay, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not as familiar with him as this. <laughs> okay. yeah. one, 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 one check mark on my record for that one. All right, this is a movie that is not aged that well, <laughs> okay. but it's still awesome. I love, I love the caveat. All right. You know, when you were a baby in your crib, your father looked down at you. He had but one hope. Someday, my son will grow to be a man. Well, look at you now. You just got your asses what? By a bunch of goddamn nerds. <laughs> 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 Never! Nerds! Yes. One. Well, I made the duck blue because I'd never seen a blue duck before, and I wanted to see one. Yeah, that's uh, uh, Billy Madison. Yes! Wow! And that's it. Wow, I only missed one. I'm, I'm kind of impressed with myself. Wow, congratulations. Thanks, man. You won yourself a bottle of water. All right. Uh, some sort of soda. Okay. And a mini Snickers. <laughs> Great day for me. All right, let's go. Let's right. go do this. I'll take my mini Snickers. Come on. Cool spot, man. Thank you. All right, here we go. Careful with your feet down here. And that is for you. I'm right cool. there. And I'm right here. All right. Oh, and all we have to do is turn on these cameras in three, two, one, now! Hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Tuna on Toast. I am Ted Stryker, joined today by a founding member of one of our most favorite bands over the last 20 plus years. He's a great guitarist, he's a great songwriter. From Incubus, Mike Einziger is here. Mikey! Great to be with you, Stryker. It is great to be with you as well. Now, for those of you watching, we've already been conversing for like 15 minutes. And every two minutes, I'm like, no, quit talking. We got to save this for the cameras. Yeah. Yeah. We've, we've always had interesting conversations, haven't we? Yes. Mikey just revealed to me just before we started, you had never seen Curb Your Enthusiasm until the pandemic started. I'd never like really watched an episode. I mean, I was aware of the show and like sort of the general humor of it, but hadn't, hadn't really like really given it like the proper viewing that it the respect, if yes. you will, that it deserves because it truly deserves a lot of respect. So you love it. It It's like being inside of my own brain. Oh, <laughs> so you're very neurotic at times. Neurotic, neurotic Jewish people from the valley. <laughs> I think there's a special place, you know, like, cause my dad, it's funny. Like my dad and his buddies, like they've been talking about, they just call it curb. Oh yeah. Curb. Right. Well, you know, it's just like, Oh now God, <laughs> I, I can't even believe like, yes. There's a few things that I'm jealous of, but I could easily incorporate into my life that happens on that show. Number one, the amount of golf they play. A lot of golf. Number two, how many lunches they go to where the weather is absolutely perfect perfect outside and they have like great bread baskets and iced teas and seven ups and all that. It's amazing. It really is incredible. <laughs> the The amount of uh, the lengths that he goes to, to avoid going to parties, yes. you know, the, the big goodbye, <laughs> the, the accidental text on purpose. Right. So, I mean, these things are like, man, how did I just 
only discover this recently. It's like insane. Okay. Other than Larry David, <laughs> who's your favorite on the show? And did it change over the seasons as you binged watched it? I mean, it's such a solid cast. Like, it, and and it stayed so consistent the whole time. Larry David is such a big personality. Like, yeah. if I saw him, I'd be super starstruck. Like, I, I'd pro like, and there aren't that many people that I would be like that. But for, I would just be like, oh my god, like, what the hell is he thinking? Like, his compl the complexities in his mind are like pretty astounding. So, I have an idea for you. When you guys were making videos for, say, Privilege and Pardon Me, and uh, oh, it costs a lot of money to make videos. It sure did. It's not as much these <laughs> days, correct? Um, no, technology has changed everything. Well, let's use the budget you had to get Larry David. Larry, what's your rate? <laughs> yeah. We're Incubus, and you're going to star in our video and maybe lip sync a new song that's not released Cameo, yet. Cameo, maybe it's like, is he on Cameo or yeah. something like that? <laughs> You know, pay a few bucks, you know, get a little <laughs> message or something. That would be awesome. No, he's, 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 yeah, extraordinary. So we're sitting here on a Sunday. It's the middle of the day. This is the first Tuna on Toast episode I've done on a weekend. And I'm privileged. Yeah. It's always a very relaxed feel, but today just felt like, it felt very Larry David curb like I woke up and I was like, I put just put on a little sweatshirt. <laughs> I was standing outside waiting for you. Did you play a little golf? <laughs> yeah, we should do that. <laughs> I almost saw you come close to hitting a bicyclist with your car. Did you see that? Um, I might have been aware of something like that, but you know, hey. No, the those those bike riders are they were coming down the hill behind me yes. and they were like going faster than me right. half the time. And I was just kind of like, I don't, and there were two of them. So yes. one was like on one side and one was on the other. And I was like, uh, <laughs> I kind of don't know what to do right now. So it was a very, very curb your enthusiasm very type of much. moment. So when I got to the stop sign down here, I just stopped and was like, you yeah. guys do what you want. And they kind of just, yeah. Um, also it's just about March 1st and we're just a couple weeks away from Incubus going on the road and you're doing some shows. Yeah. Not that you need to practice, but have you guys No, we we do need to practice. Okay. Like it's kind of crazy. Like I'm 45 now. Like it feels different to like play concerts at age 45 than it did at 25. <laughs> the <laughs> physical part or the mental part? <laughs> Probably both, but the physical part as well. Really? Like it's just everybody's like everybody's got like a bad knee and a <laughs> messed up wrist and a bad shoulder or something and it's like it's not it's like it used to be like just effortless for all of all of us and now we're kind of like oh we gotta we kind of gotta work on this a little bit it's uh it's it, it's interesting that's for sure but so have you had any practice then before? yeah yeah oh, we've, okay <laughs> we've been practicing and like but how does that work for guys like you who have so many songs and some of these songs, if we're going back to like Fungus Among Us or Science, and you maybe want to dig one up or two from that era, is your brain, can it just go, whoop, my hands go like this? Or how it's, does it work? It's really interesting that you ask that question because, you know, a lot of, especially the older that I get, I go back and have to sort of like relearn um, certain songs. And um, like, I realized that a lot of my playing is like a lot more technical than I ever like sort of realized before. So wow. I'm having to kind of like, relearn to how to play parts that I wrote when I was like, you know, 19, 20 years old, or I just play them in a way that's like super difficult. Like maybe it could be easier, but I just played it in a really difficult way. But then this muscle memory thing starts kicking in after I like, I'll go through it a few times. Like I've, and it'll feel like I'm like, Oh my God, I've never even, it's like, I've never even played it before. And then like a few times in, it's like, Oh yeah, that's where my finger used to go. That's how it, that's how you do it. And then it just like something kicks in. And it's wow. so, it's so interesting. Like, like there are even songs where I hear them, um, you know, obviously some, many of our songs, um, sort of the, the more, um, identifiable, recognizable Incubus songs, the ones that people really know, like, you know, we've played those so many times that like, that's like whatever, but some of the, like, you know, sort of deeper cuts, it's like, I hear them back and I'm like, it's almost like I'm hearing them for the first time. I'm like, oh yeah. Oh yeah, we wrote that. That's crazy. Like, and and then playing it is the same way too. It's like I have to acclimate. It's not just like instant recall like it used to be when I was younger. So yeah, it's just so interesting. You hinted at something a couple times, and I want to just do a somewhat deep dive into it. 
when you listen to songs that you guys wrote when you were somewhere between, let's just say, 19 to 23 years old. And that was science. You, and, and here you are in your 40s. You are surprised by how good some of the songs are now, technically looking back. Um, and I'm not saying, oh, I'm yeah, great yeah, or anything yeah, like that. Yeah, like, like, just to give you an example, Brandon sang a lot of things in like a register that's probably really, really, really difficult to do. Mm. And now it's like, oh shit, like <laughs> how are we going to do this? But, you know, like he, he like trains like full on, like really like works really hard at it. And it was always like really effortless for me. But now I'm like, damn, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta get, I gotta step it up a little bit. Cause it's, right. it, it, it's funny, like what just comes naturally to you as a 20 year old versus, you know, like when you're in your forties and after, like they say the warranty expires at age 40. So it's, <laughs> no, 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 don't say that. Don't say that. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it, it's, it's just a trip, you know, like doing this for such a long period of time. And, you know, here we are in 2022, um, you know, playing concerts and I mean, to we, a lot of people to very yeah. big audiences, man. It's pretty crazy. It's so exciting. And it's, it's always feels good for someone like me who loved your band or a band from early on, but you guys in particular, and you see him at the Roxy or something and like, yep. Hey, a lot of people know these songs. And here we are all these years later and those people have grown up and sometimes they have kids and they want to go. And then sometimes there's like a 20 year old who hears pardon me on the radio or on a streaming service. And then they do a deep dive and they're like, Whoa, these guys are unbelievable. Um, did this career go up until this point, how you thought it would? No, none of this was how I thought it would go. Um, you know, I mean, it was all, I mean, I guess it was continually surprising and for us, you know, having uh, kind of achieved all this success at a pretty young age, we were just doing what sort of came natural to us. It wasn't, I don't think there was ever this expectation that we were going to be successful. It was more just like, this is really fun. Let's keep doing it and doing more of it. And, you know, writing songs was really fun and like, okay, well, let's just keep doing that. And people seem to like it. You know, it, that's really what it felt like. Um, but there was also this element of, um, I, I guess it all felt pretty logical too. Like in the really early days when, you know, when we were high school kids in, in the Valley, um, you know, in Calabasas and all the surrounding kind of areas where people had nothing to do at the time, you know, right. this is the yeah. late, mid, mid nineties. Um, we gave all of these young people something to do on a Friday or Saturday night. And somebody to root for who lived right in their own backyard. Yeah, it, 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 we definitely had like this kind of like crazy rabid following from the beginning, like even playing at people's parties in their backyards, um, like the, 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 the crowds would get crazy. And, wow. and it was interesting too, because there were other bands that would play and they would come and there'd be like five people watching them. And then all of a sudden there'd be like 500 people when we played and then there'd be five people when whoever went on after us. And it was just crazy. There was like crowd surfing and people diving off of houses and roofs and roofs and jumping in the pool and lighting stuff on fire. It was like, <laughs> I mean, it was just, Amazing. it was just chaos. And, and it, like I said, like there was an aspect of it that seemed totally logical to me at the time. It's like, oh, if we just tell all these people about this show and we pass out these flyers, like people will buy the tickets and, and they'll show up and they showed up. They really showed up. Like, and I don't know if it's that we were like really good or something. Like, I don't think we were that good, but, <laughs> but people like, people good. wanted to come and see us for whatever reason. And then when we graduated to like, you know, we used to play actually, I don't know if you recall, do you remember Mancini's? It was a little tiny, tiny club in the, in off Roscoe in the okay. Valley. All right. And it was kind of not in the greatest area, you know, like sometimes people would get shot or stabbed or whatever. And then they, they closed it. Um, and then there was also this place, the country club. And it was also in the Valley, same sort of thing. Like, and once we like were able to start playing shows at these places, we played a few and then they got closed down so that we, from there, we kind of graduated to like the whiskey and the Roxy and the Troubadour. Were you and, playing those shows in the Valley because you lived 15 minutes away and to get to the Roxy and those sort of places, it's 40 minutes from Calabasas. That's right. That's right. Mancini's in the Valley was like a place where they had these sort of underground like punk shows. Oh, okay. Not that we were a punk band, but like it was a place where like young 
bands and like like you know who played there a lot was uh, the Skeletones. Oh really? Yeah. Wow. And like they'd have like you know guys from Fishbone and other bands up there playing with them. It was just like this little like maybe 150 person little club, but it was like oh. This, that's how this works. You play in these little places. Like we just, we were learning as we were going. And then. Who um, was setting up your equipment? You guys us, were doing it? We did everything. We was were, there, were there sound checks and like, oh, we got to turn that up and this lower? There was a sound check, you know, but it was, I mean, we were just at the mercy of whoever was there doing it. And you were 17 at the time or were you 16, past 16, 16 years 16. old? We could barely Holy drive. Mackerel. We were, we had just gotten our, our driver's licenses. We were. Just Brandon got his driver's license first. So I might have even been 15 at some point during some of those. I can't remember exactly. So was he driving you guys? For a little while. He was like the only one who had his license. He got his, he got his license first. He was the oldest of us. So. Wow. And um, so there were a few months and then Jose, I think, came second, you know, and then the rest of us followed. But um, it, was a, it, was, it was a trip, really, looking back on all of it. It's like so many things had to line up in order to make all this stuff happen, you know? And it's like, like I said, so much of it seemed logical at the time, but now like I kind of can't even believe it. I'm curious about your folks or mom or dad, or did they ever say to you guys, ah, the band is great, but listen, you're going to finish high school in a year. And all the time they did (laughs) all the time. I mean, my dad's a doctor, you know, like he's retiring ish. I don't know. He, my dad, he, you know, he'll, he'll work, he'll work his whole life. That's just his, who he is. But, you know, I think he saw music as cute, you know, oh, right. like, but really wanted me to, to, to go to college, really wanted me to kind of take the, what he, I, I think in his mind was sort of the quickest route from point A to point B. Um, he just don't want, you know, he just cared about me. He just didn't want me to struggle. Right, but also to, I mean, his way of thinking, how is it possible my son and his idiot friends. Yeah, exactly. From Calabasas, where the Red Robin is right there. Yep. How are they going to make? There's no chance. There's no way. <laughs> there's no way. I mean, we 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 had countless people tell us like, oh, you know, this business is so hard. <laughs> but that's also why you just have to not give a fuck. Like that's really what it is. Like in whatever you do, you really mm. like courage, like raw, just bravery will get you very far. If you're, is that if, maybe what led you to starting or being part of Mix Halo? Is like I'm going to take a risk here and take a jump, and it, it was the same sort of curiosity that was kind of the the genesis of starting a band. It's the same. It's mm. the same exact thing, which was like, okay, well, I want to know how music works. So in order to learn how music works, I had to start a band to figure that out. And with Mix Halo, it's a, you know, it's a networking technology company. And there was sort of a question that I wanted to answer about whether or not you could stream an audio signal to somebody's phone fast enough to where they could hear it and watch a concert or a sporting event or something like that and be able to hear everything in real time. In your ears, in real time, to hear the sound that is that the band is hearing in their ears. That's what Mix yeah, Halo it, is. It unlocks the basically the the sound board, like the the mixing board. It unlocks wow. it for anybody. Um, and you can just basically open an app and you're right you're in. Like and, and and so it's it's pretty transformative where like if you're in a nosebleed section of a of a stadium, like you don't have to struggle to hear anything. If somebody's talking into a microphone, you can hear them like they're talking to you. They could whisper your name and you could hear them with no problem. And it's it, it, it unlocks something interesting. Um, but in order to answer that question, I had to start a networking technology company to figure it out. And oh. now the company is, you know, growing like crazy. And it's, um, it's, a, it's Congratulations a, so, on that. Jumping you. into the technology space and having so much success with this. And I... I remember you telling me about it years ago yeah. and just like with a lot of tech and I'm not saying with everybody, but I was like, well, how is this going to work? Which I should have been asking. I should have just yeah. said, okay, let me put these in. Let me press that. <gasps> oh my God. This sounds so good, Mike. This is incredible. Yeah. It's pretty, uh, it, it's pretty crazy and it's hard to put into words what it like sort of what the experience is like, but I think at some point everybody will figure it out. And it's like the, the easiest way to describe it is all of us artists while we're performing concerts on stage we're all wearing headphones maybe like 99 percent of us um 20 years ago um when we first started wearing headphones uh people didn't really do that yet 
And everyone was like, oh, it's so weird. And like, I can't get into the show. It's going to change everything. And it's like, well, here we are 20 years later. And who's wearing headphones? Every single artist that's on stage. And I, there's a learning curve with it. Um, and I just think like eventually over time, it's, it's, it's not like a choice. Like you have to decide one or the other, just everybody has headphones anyway. And it's like something that you can access. And I, I like, you know, if I was 5,000 feet away from somebody shouting into a microphone, I'd probably prefer listening in headphones so I could hear everything. That's absolutely, just me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Versicolor. Yep. This is something that I've learned about recently that you and your wife started as a result of a skin condition with her. Yeah. So now what is this particular space you've, <laughs> built, you've taken a deep dive into? Yeah, it, this is this is something that like no one would ever anticipate um, like me getting involved with. But um, basically, in a, in a nutshell, we've started a biopharmaceutical development company that's developing drugs to treat inflammatory skin diseases. And um, it's been really interesting. Um, my wife got basically what you could consider a pigmentation disorder on her back, which means it affected her skin color. And she got really sort of curious um, because it's a really harmless condition that goes away. And when it goes away, your skin goes back to normal. Okay. And she was just kind of like, well, what is this thing that happens to your skin that changes the color of your skin or impacts the color of your skin and then goes away like it never happened and doesn't do any harm to you. And it turns out there's a there's a microorganism um, that colonizes your microbiome. I'm going to get a little technical here. Okay. But it causes certain changes to happen in your skin that are temporary. But there are actually some things that it does that are actually really good for your skin in certain ways. And this is how all pharmaceutical development works, actually. is like you sort of take things that that nature makes and repurpose them. And we found that by utilizing some of their certain chemicals that are produced naturally in the microbiome and their purpose is to basically be an anti-inflammatory. So this organism that colonizes your skin, it starts growing in a certain way. Okay. And then your skin starts producing all of these different chemicals to basically say, Hey, like don't get inflamed. Don't cause, you know, itching or, you know, uh, all sorts of stuff. And so what we do is we we utilize those chemical compounds and repurpose them, and they're very powerful anti-inflammatories. Wow. And when did this, so did this a company start for you during the pandemic when you had a little bit more time on your hands and you could do, wait a minute, you're not officially a scientist or anything, but I know you're a very, very smart guy. So what hats did you have to wear? Who did you bring in? How, like this is... What an undertaking. It kind of really just goes back to uh, the concept of, of being brave, really. Mm. Um, I have no permission to be doing any of these things. I, I didn't have any permission. I had to give myself permission to be a musician and start a band and do all that. And, you know, starting a networking technology company, starting a, a pharmaceutical company. These are all things that like you're, you're supposed to sort of like get a degree or, you know, get an education in before you do, but you better have people that you can be mentored by that, yes. that really, really know what they're talking about. Right. Cause that's, that's really sort of the key is um, finding the right mentorship is really important in whatever you do. So I think that's kind of like part of the formula it has been, um, you know, like for example, with Mix Halo, you know, I was able to find the right uh, technical expertise, truly, like not just like, you know, some charlatan who, you know, kind of maybe knows a little bit about the space. Like we actually built something transformative that large tech companies have come to us and, and like kind of started snooping around and being like, hey, what is this? Because they don't believe it does what we say it does, but it does. Yeah. And in terms of pharmaceutical development, you know, that's the sort of thing like, uh, you know, I'm on, I'm on these, these calls with, you know, all these different executives in the pharmaceutical <laughs> world. And like, they're like, Dr. Einziger, can you blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I'm like, that's so cute that you think I'm a doctor. That's great. I love it. You know, like, cause the oh, vast wow. majority of people that I talk to when I'm sort of in that world, they have no idea that I play in a band or anything. And the funniest thing is like, I started this company with my wife in 20. 16. Mm. I mean, it's, it's a little bit of a misnomer to say that I started the company. We started doing our research. Like, I mean, 
we've been doing like just art, basically like trying to answer scientific questions for the last several years. And then commercializing technology is a whole sort of other animal. Um, and we're in the, you know, we're kind of doing both simultaneously now, but um, you know, I would come off stage in like, I'd, you know, in like, in like, Cape Town, South Africa, yeah. and jump on a call with a bunch of like, you know, pharmacologists that and is- immunologists. Like I'd be all sweaty. Wow. So sorry guys, I just got off stage. And it's like, that's just my life, you know? Yeah. It's always been my life. Like, uh, you know, back in 2008, when I went to college, it was like, all of a sudden I'm in a classroom, you know, studying the history of physics. And like, this is just the my, weird, hold on, hold this on, is just the on. weirdness this of my world. class at Santa Monica City College. Great. Great junior college. You went to Harvard. <laughs> yeah. Back in 2008, the band took a very small, short hiatus. Um, did you apply to get in there? I did. You did. Actually, um, it's kind of a funny story. Um, Flea and I, we applied to USC together to go to music school. Okay. Together. It was like this thing that we were going to do. We were like, yeah, let's, you know, like, let's go like really learn about like, these things that we've been kind of doing our whole lives, but never really like studied academically up until that point. And so it was like a kind of a brotherhood type thing. Yes. And then, and then I was like, well, I'll just apply to Harvard and we'll just see, you know, but then I got in. Did you get into USC as well? Yeah, you did. Okay. Yeah. So you applied to Harvard. So did you have to write an essay or anything like that. Of course. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was, it was pretty intense. Like all of it going through that process, having just been playing rock concerts for like 20 years or whatever, however long I had been at that point. Yeah. It was kind of a funny thing to kind of have to be like, all right, sorry, flea. (laughs) I'm out. (laughs) But he went to USC and studied anyway. And so it was cool. He was doing that at the same time I was at Harvard. And so we were kind of like comparing notes and you know, it was fun. What was your biggest takeaway from your time going to school? You know, my experience at Harvard was like, really transformative because I wasn't there, you know, under, I guess the kind of typical set of circumstances, which is really like everything is riding on my whole career is riding on this. I, I was there to just genuinely learn. I didn't even really know what I was doing. All I knew is that like, and it's the same, I I guess it's the same thing with like starting the band or starting these different companies. I didn't necessarily know what I was doing. I just knew that I wanted to be there and I wanted to be learning. And did you put the effort in while you were there? It was, yeah. Like I, I was, I was really, um, a pretty hardcore student. In fact, like my friends that were there, like we had kind of a little crew of, there are a bunch of LA kids that I ended up meeting, okay. um, that are still to this day, like my really good friends, wow. um, that, uh, they were just like, you're insane. Like, like we're going to this party. Like, why don't you come? And I was like, that's like, they're like, it's going to be crazy. I was like, that's cute. Like, yeah. Go, uh, go. Hello, I played <laughs> to a 70,000 seat venues and had a jolly good time after those shows. You know, what was really funny though, is that I was at Harvard during, um, or like right around the time when, um, the social network came out. So that was kind of interesting too, oh, to like wow. kind of see it portrayed yeah. as I was sort of experiencing it in real time and being like, all right, like how, <laughs> how similar is this? You know, like, and some parts of it were filmed there and other parts weren't. And, um, it was interesting. And, you know, and Rashida, who was in the movie too, she's my friend also. And she went to Harvard also. So it's kind wow. of a funny little. Without saying names, is anyone that you met at Harvard, have they gone on to like, they are just doing something unbelievable in life right now? I would say most of them. Really? Yeah. That's, that's one of the things that's, that, that was so crazy about being there. And then, I mean, a lot of the people that I met while I was there sort of like were somehow instrumental in helping me build things that I'm building now in some way, shape or form, whether it's introducing me to, to somebody or, you know, like kind of just helping me conceive of some idea or framework for, you know, building things is, is wildly creative and also really difficult. I think that's why I enjoy it. The, just the people that I met, that's the biggest takeaway. Like I just met the most amazing people while I was there. And like, you know, many of whom are still like really close friends of mine to this day. Cool, man. Yeah. It's, I feel so it's an amazing, chatting with you, Mike. It's an amazing environment. It really is. It's like Disneyland for nerds. And one of the things that I think gets lost on young people, you can't explain this to a young person. They, they, they can't, there's just no substitute. It's like professors 
love nothing more than to to share wisdom about their field. And so um, I used to go and hang out with all my professors and just and I was so interested in in you know in quantum physics and and um, sort of where uh, the quantum world kind of rubs up against philosophy. At some point, it really just becomes like it's so weird. It, that's what I was so um, I think that's why I gravitated towards it. It, it. it becomes philosophy at a certain point and I could just talk about it endlessly with my teachers. Right. And they, right. they, they were so like welcoming of a student to come in and start asking all these like deep questions, you know, but the office hours would be like, you know, sometimes there'd be a lot of kids like, you know, trying to come in, but they were just trying to, trying to do their homework or whatever. Like they weren't, you know, they're under a different set of pressures, but man, like, like really having, I, I never had relationships with teachers like that, you know, with professors. So it just gave me a totally different appreciation for, you know, academic yeah. institutions in general and how much you can learn from, from people if you just ask. Makes sense. Take us back now. We're going back to music. Yep, let's do it. Between science and make yourself. Where were you professionally, you and the guys? Yep. Because... There was buzz on Incubus here, but I don't know if someone in Chicago knew you guys. Like, did you have a re official big record deal at that point? We did. We were um, we were signed to Sony Music through Immortal and Epic. Oh um, right, we were right. label we were label mates with Corn, um, and you know Rage Against the Machine and Pearl Is that Jam. Pontius, no Pontius, oh, yeah. yeah, okay. And Happy Happy Paul Walters yes. and Paul Pontius, and yeah. then um, at the time. I want to say it was uh, Richard Griffiths and there were a few other uh, other people and, and Steve Rennie who was at, at, at Epic. That's how we met him. Um, he was the general manager of the West Coast of Epic Records. So, um, you know, we, we had a record deal. Um, Science was our first major label release. Um, obviously, there weren't really any commercial songs on that album, but we, we tapped into something that was a little different. It was... I can't even put a finger on it, but you know, we were touring like crazy, like with system of a down, like we were label mates. They were on Columbia. We were on Epic and the label figured out like, Oh, well, we could just put you all together and probably save a bunch of money. <laughs> you know, like they could combine costs. And, um, so were you guys friends with the bands that were from LA coming up at a similar time, like system Lincoln park, Huba stank. Uh, so we, we knew the, the, the guys from Huba stank. I had kind of, like I knew Dan and Doug like yeah. from before I didn't know the Lincoln Park guys until later um I mean later as in like I don't know like early 2000s or whatever I didn't know them my my younger brother knew them like he 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 like went to summer school with one okay. of those guys and they're all like such sweet sweet guys oh yeah but not so much like we didn't really know too many of the local bands we kind of really just did our own thing um, there were a couple of other bands, like there was uh, this band Frontside from Temple City. They were like our, they were friends of ours and we would like do shows with them. And, you know, I really, I, I would, I would, it's so funny. It's just like such a crazy long, long, long ago, long, long, long ago. Um, I somehow convinced Paul Tillette to put us on some Golden Boy shows. Um, Paul Tillette, he started or created Coachella. Yeah. Yes. Like I met Paul in probably 94, 95. Okay. And um, there was another guy named Adam Seidel who worked for Golden Voice as well. And like, I was just relentless. <laughs> like I would show up at their office and be like, hey, let me pass out some flyers for you. And they'd be like, cool. And they started actually like, you know, because I would go pass flyers out for Incubus shows anyway. So I'd kind of be like, hey, like. I just sort of weaseled my way in there as a 16-year-old kid who had just got my driver's license. Wow. Um, they ended up putting us on a show with Sublime at the Palace. It was the show that they where they filmed their, like, it was like a live performance. Wow. Live the perform Palace was across the street from Capitol Records. Yeah. The Palace. Yes. To me, that was like Dodger Stadium. Right. At that time. It's a decent-sized venue. So you're on the bill with Sublime. Yeah. Okay, go on. We're like the first of like five bands or something like that. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just kind of crazy. I, I, I don't know how, like, you know, and he put us on some other shows as well. And we always did really well. So it was like we were kind of a welcome addition to any bill because we would bring an audience. 
they couldn't drink, but right. yeah, <laughs> they were all like 15 years, 16 years old. It was like a bunch of skater kids, you know, and some hippies and some heshers. And it was like a mixture of, of very, very <laughs> interesting group of people that would come out to an incubus show in the, in the mid nineties. But then, um, you know, we got to this point where every place we played was just sold out, Wow, you know, like, we would play at the whiskey or the troubadour. The yeah. troubadour really kind of became the troubadour and the in the Roxy actually. Like I met Nick Adler, yeah, you know, yeah. Paul from the troubadour, Paul and Christine. Like they all like we just had like this little crew, and we'd kind of alternate between playing the whiskey, the Roxy, and the troubadour, blowing them out, selling them out every time. And there would be a lot, huge line outside of people who couldn't get in. I, I wish I could explain, but. That's just how it was. And, 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 I, and I remember specifically around that time, there's a lot, a lot of bands who could get their friends or classmates, whatever it is, family members to come to the first couple shows. After that, they're like, ah, I can't go anymore. But you guys were doing such an awesome job that your friend told another friend, told another friend, like, if you want to have a freaking good time, you got to come out to the Troubadour tonight because this is a band that needs to be on your radar. And that's how I remember it specifically for Incubus. There was a, a very specific thing that happened where it was no longer, like, people that we knew at the shows. Mm. I remember that. I remember, like, you know, it was like, okay, we don't know these people. Like, maybe I saw them at the last one, but I don't know them. You know, and that was interesting. And actually, the first time I ever signed something for somebody was at that Sublime show. Really? It was the very first time somebody, like, asked me for an autograph. It's pretty funny. What'd you sign? Um, Like, just a flyer okay. ticket. Yeah. You know, somebody had a ticket to the show. And yeah. It was, like, it was, and, and we were also playing other shows, like, around that time, too. So it was just a very funny thing to experience, you know? Like, like you're saying... You know, everybody can start a band and get, you know, their their family to invite some people and whatever. Yeah. But like it was very clearly not people that we knew show that were showing up. What's the first Incubus song you heard on the radio? Was it Pardon Me? Was it Privilege? What radio station? K-Rock. The very first time we ever heard uh, Incubus on K-Rock was um, Pardon Me. I'll never forget it, too. It was wow. like it was very transformative because... At that time, too, like, media outlets were, like, s everything was very focused. Like, there were only, like, in, in, in L.A., there was one radio station and probably half the country listened to it, you know? And it was, like, MTV and K-Rock were kind of, like, the only game in town, really. And, um, and so I remember, you know, someone told us, like, hey, they're going to play you guys on K-Rock today. And it was, like... We were, we were driving around in the valley. Um, like, we actually were playing golf at the, the Van Nuys. <laughs> I'm pointing like it's over there. That Van Nuys, like, little par three yes, golf course. Yeah. We were over there fucking around, no. like, dr drinking and, like, you know. Right. And, and we were, like, we were in the parking lot at that Van Nuys golf course place. Was it Jed the Fish then for the catch of the day? Was it, or was it? I, I was can't it remember. Night when I played it? It was in the afternoon. I think Six. it was in the, it was in the afternoon. Okay. I don't remember specifically if it was Jed. I, I just remember it was like, holy fucking shit. Like, this is like out of a movie. Like, this is crazy. And, um, and it was the album version of the song. Like, because we had, we had had all this like success with, um, in other parts of the country where people were playing the acoustic version of the right. song. But, I remember but that. people weren't really playing the electric, like the, the album version. Um, and, and it had, been released as a single like many months prior and like was kind of just not really didn't really like do anything as a as a single but then like as soon as as soon as k-rock played it like it set off like a crazy chain of events that like led to you know like what are some of the things that happened over the next six months that maybe wouldn't have happened if all the radio didn't start going on we got added to MTV. That was a big deal. Mm. Pardon me. Like we made a video for pardon me. It started getting played on MTV and I'll, I'll never forget it. Like it was like one week, you know, we sold 10,000 albums or something. The next week it was like 275,000. Holy albums. crap. Like it was just like, wow. <laughs> and, and, but we'd been, you know, we'd really been building. Yes. So yes. like I said, it all felt logical to me at the time. Right. But now looking back on it, it's like, I, I don't know, like how that happened. But it was crazy because it, it really took off from there and just kept going. Like it kept going for many years. Because it was 
on that particular album before you made the next one, Privilege, Pardon Me, Stellar. Stellar! Oh my God. Oh, and the, Drive. And Drive. And Drive. Drive was the end of that right. album. And that, was that not the, was the biggest, biggest one. song? By far. Why? Because it crossed over to other formats? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was on the, you know, the sort of like pop radio stations and all that. And, yeah. And um, who knew that an Incubus song that wasn't even your first single, maybe the fourth or fifth one, was going to cross over to these people like that? It all felt logical to me at the time. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you know, Stellar's going to come after Pardon Me and then Drive's just going to be huge. And it f fucking happened somehow. Like, seriously, I thought that at the time. Like, I, I thought that Drive was going to be this big song and it somehow was. Yeah, it's crazy. Do it's you weird. remember when you and the guys visited me at the radio station, you brought your instruments, and the studio, one would think, oh, you're on K-Rock, you must have this giant thing. It was smaller than this tuna on toast bedroom. This is my house, my bedroom. And you guys were in the hallway, and somehow the wires were in my board, and you played a few songs. Yeah, I remember that. We were scattered all over the hallway. Yes. There were, we, we each had like a little funny, like sort of, station yeah and we were all in like different rooms and we somehow had to like figure it we i mean you know, I we could all we could that. all hear each other i have that oh on wow cd wow yes if you ever want to hear it i do want to hear it okay stellar is so good because i remember brandon was like okay one two three four and like kilmore did something on the turntables the turntables were actually i think in my room right in front of me yeah and he was like duh, 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 duh. it was oh Man. The funny thing is, too, like in the earlier days when we were playing, you know, all these little tiny venues, like poor Kilmore would be like on the ground. <laughs> like we'd be on the stage and he'd be like off the side somewhere because like the stage would be so small. Yeah. Like and also he had like these, you know, these turntables and the needles would skip. So he'd be like, just put me down there. And then like he'd be like with the audience. Wow. Oh my <laughs> it's just a, a different, a different, you know, a different time, a different world. Um, but yeah, that was really fun playing, uh, in the hallways at K rock. It felt important to us too, because it was like, we grew, I grew up in LA listening to K rock. So it was like, you know, going and playing at like the forum or the Hollywood bowl, like all these places that I went to a million times as a young person to like, I mean, I went to the Hollywood bowl to see like fireworks when I was like four or five years old, you know, yeah. I went to the Greek theater to see the go-go's play when I was five. Wow. You know, like that was really, I and think, now you're one of my first concerts. Venues. Yeah. And, and with all of these groups that I grew up listening to, you know, that was also like one of the weirdest parts about all of it was like, wow, all these bands that were like touring with and playing with, a lot of them I like grew up listening to. That like, Who was the nicest of all the bands that just sticks out? Most of them are like, you know, the ones that are the ones that are like real rock bands, you know, like they've seen so much shit in their careers. Like yeah. they're 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 just cool. You know, um, I don't know. You know, like. Like the guys from Rage Against the Machine are mm. just like so chill and down to earth. I love those guys. Um, you know, the Foo Fighters. Oh, Dave wow. Grohl's like such a nice dude. It's amazing, yeah. actually, the stamina that that guy has to like deal with what he deals with. I, I'm in awe of that. Like right. yeah. at this point in his life, he could just be chilling. Absolutely. He doesn't need to but be making, making movies, movies and, and all kinds of and shit. Then hosting this and then another new Foo Fighters album and then doing a tour that goes nonstop and still calls up radio stations and goes on podcasts and does the hot ones things. It's crazy, yeah. man. Yeah. I, you know, it's, it's funny, like getting to know all these dudes over a long period of time. Cause we, we all did the same shit for a very, very, very long yeah. time, you know? And, and at some point, like, you know, we're all like playing together, or flying around together, whatever, wow. you know? So there, there's kind of like, I think this appreciation that I just have as I get older for mm. how unlikely all of it is to begin with, you know? Um, you know, I see a lot of, a lot of the guys from the band, those sort of bands, like, you know, I see them around all the time. Like we live, in similar places and stuff like yeah. that. And um, it's just funny. It's funny. Do you ever see, have you ever seen Dave Grohl in the supermarket? I haven't seen Dave Grohl in the supermarket. <laughs> Fat Mike was here and he's like, I always see Dave Grohl in the supermarket. I've seen, I've seen, <laughs> I've run into Taylor and in places like that before, but I love that guy. He's, he's hilarious. Okay. So here we go. 1999, 
Make Yourself. 2001, that's when Morning View comes out. You yep. record the album at that wonderful house in Malibu. And every time I'm driving by Zoom on PCH, I've said it to my wife 10,000 times. That's the Incubus Morning View. She's like, I know. Shut up, you idiot. <laughs> you, if I feel like you don't feel pressure you're a very relaxed guy, but did you or the band feel some sort of like, oh my God, we've got to somehow match what just happened over the last year and a half? You know, it makes perfect sense that that would feel what it, that would seem to be the case, but it just didn't feel that way at all to me at the time. At the time, it was like, oh, you know, look at this amazing place we get to make music in and we're just going to write the best album we ever wrote in the next you know, few months. And wow. that was it. That's just how it felt to me. And also knowing that it was different that time because we had already, you know, sold a couple million albums or something like that at the time. And actually when we were at Morning View, um, Drive was really like the biggest that it ever was. So it was like this thing that kept sort of churning as we were making new music. So we knew that people were just going to be really excited to hear whatever it was that we, you know, the songs that we wrote. And so I just thought it was cool. It didn't seem like, to me, it didn't feel like pressure. It seemed like we had done what we wanted to do naturally and on our terms to get to oh, where we were. That's amazing. So it was like, just keep doing what you're doing type of thing. You know, like I didn't feel at all like, oh my God, we have to deliver. We have to do this or we have to do that. To me, we created sort of a dream scenario for ourselves. Right. Now looking back on it, I kind of can't believe what we pulled off. Then you go, nice to know you and wish you were here. Those two singles still two of my top are you in songs. And are you in? Um, wow. You know, it's funny because when I look back on it too, um, a lot of people were really concerned about it. Not us. But people around in us what, in what sort of way spending all this money to make an album not in a studio. We had to bring all the equipment in, and rent this big house. We're a bunch of like twenty-two year olds or three or whatever we were at the time. Yeah, it's like who's going to trust a bunch of twenty-three-year-old kids to actually like do that? But we did it. You know, one of the things that was kind of important to me at the time was you know bringing in Scott Litt as a producer. You know, he he kind of I think commanded the respect a lot of, of a lot of people in the, the music industry. Right. And so he was yes. kind of like, I was kind of like hiding behind Scott a little <laughs> bit. Like, hey, man, here's what we're going to do. Like, you tell him it's going to be cool, right? <laughs> you know, so there were people at the label that were like real concerned about it. Everyone wanted sort of the, the straightest route from point A to point B, right? Yeah. Like that seems, but I, I just, you know. Even certain members of the band were concerned about it. <laughs> wow. They exactly concerned about what? The songs you were making or the I way mean, you were doing it? I mean, is it going to sound great? It's not in a studio. Oh, like, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Man, what do you remember? Just one memory that comes to mind while being in that house. Walking around in the house like at like, you know, four o'clock in the morning when everyone's just sleeping, just going, holy fuck, this is my life. <laughs> Uh, like I, I really had a lot of those moments, like, just like, wow, I can't believe that I'm here. And like, this is what we're doing. Like, how crazy is this? I mean, I, I, I appreciated it a lot. I didn't have the perspective that I do now, but I did appreciate it. You know, it's great, man. And then after that, a crow left of the murder comes out and yep. does amazing light grenades after that, which debuts at number one. You guys are just rolling like crazy. Are you having fun at that time? Do you recall, like, holy crap, this is actually really fun? I mean, there, there, it was really fun. Um, I would say around the Light Grenades era is when, like, we, I think we were getting to an age where, at least for me, like, I was starting to kind of feel like, am I just going to keep doing this over and over and over again? It was fun, and I enjoyed it, and I enjoyed the process of making music, but I think that's when I started to question um, for me personally, like, is this, am I just going to do this for the rest of my life? Because it was, we had built up so much success and, um, you know, there was like anytime that happens, you know, naturally sort of, there are a lot of other people that are connected to you who are reliant on that success. And so I started to feel, I think a little bit during that time, like, is this what I want to do? in this manner, like it's this huge thing where like we focus all this time and energy and we like make this album and then it comes out and then we tour behind it for years. And like, we're never at home 
I'm not complaining about it right. in any way, but there yeah, are certain yeah, yeah. aspects of it that over a long period of time started like wondering like, okay, what's my life going to be like in the much longer term. And shortly after that was like, you know, when I went to college and all that, you know, so I started really just thinking about my future um, from just a pure sort of like happiness perspective. It's only been until maybe the last year or two with what you just said, I've been able to appreciate when artists talk about that because no one ever, it's clear that everyone appreciates the success and is like, oh my God, what a life we're living. But to hear you say, wow, all these people are depending on us. We are in this cycle of going, going, going with these guys. We do this, we do this, do this. We run around. Now I'm getting exhausted. We've got to talk to the radio station in Nebraska and then we've got to talk to Idiot Striker in LA and then we've got to go play <laughs> this show here. And it's like, is it? do you think it's at all similar to an actor who's on a sitcom or a scripted show for eight, nine, 10 years. And then they're like, there's some, there's another world out there. That's exactly right. You know, it's like any world that you exist in for a long period of time, decades, you know, there's a repetitive aspect of it that it doesn't matter how romantic it sounds to the outside world. It just becomes repetitive at a certain point. And that has nothing to do with, you know, I've, I've always been appreciative of the success and the opportunity but sure. at the same time I've always considered myself sort of a lifetime you know band member like it's something that I'll do for as long as I can in my whole life but in order for me to be able to do that I also have to be able to to um, feel fulfilled in other ways yes, and I think that I that's that. I get that yeah I think that's something that the whole band really like understands at this point for each individual member, right? Absolutely. Okay, so then do you see yourselves every few years making five new songs, eight new songs, 20 new songs? I don't really know. It's, it's you know, music making has to happen in a really natural way for us, or it's just, you know, I, I mean, I suppose it's that, I suppose that's probably true for any any like real there's so many any real rock band there's so many different types of artists and you know groups that are put together by other people and you know and songs that are written by others but we do everything ourselves like you know when we play a show like you know we don't like really get into wardrobe we like are just who we are and we just play yeah. like it's an honest expression of us it always has been so it's if it's authentic to who we are um it has to happen naturally on its own um i'm also acutely aware of the fact that you know we have this huge body of work the you know all these songs that that we've written many of them a very long time ago that are really important to people you know um and we're so lucky for that like that's just like the biggest privilege of all is to be able to have you know written music that like actually means something to people because that's the hardest part is like actually connecting yeah um right. And that's also something that I appreciate um, in our peer group as well. Like the other artists, the other bands that we kind of came up with that are still like, you know, they're still like, you know, playing shows and like, you know, people care more about their music than they did even before. It's like it grows, you know, and I think that that music um, becomes the backdrop of our lives in these really interesting ways that I think just become stronger over time. Right, definitely. At, at least for me, you it know, is, yeah. and film is the same way. Um, you know, it really kind of like, it, it's meaningful to people. And so now like when we play shows and like, I'm just, you know, hearing, you know, 30,000 people singing the lyrics to something. It's like, holy shit. Like we actually connected with these people. Yes. It's not just like, I'm just phoning it in right now. Like this actually means something to people. And, and not, it didn't mean, and it's not something that means something to people temporarily. It's year after year, after year, after year, after year. We hear the first few notes of many Incubus songs and it takes us back to a place somewhere in our lives, but we're also to sell able to celebrate it right now. So yeah. I'm so happy that you guys are playing shows and uh, I'm so happy we're hanging out. Dan, we've been here like 53 minutes already. <laughs> Is, can we segue, please, into some true crime talk? Let's do it. Okay. So, luckily, this podcast, Tune on Toast, we're, we're doing all right. But now that we're going to talk true crime, we may go to number one on the charts. <laughs> so, here we go. Elaine Park, yeah. uh, many of you guys watching know, but if you don't, the summary is this. Back in 2017, her car was found on Pacific Coast Highway but she was not found. 
Correct. And she has not been found since then. Nobody has been arrested. And that's where we stand today. Back in 2017, both you and Neil Strauss were on the radio with me, like shortly after that happened, discussing this case. Yep. Since then, an unbelievably successful podcast called To Live and Die in L.A. that Neil hosts, and you're on it as well, right? Yeah. Um, we were documenting um, as we were going, and, um, and a lot of that content was included in the podcast. Right. Um, so as we sit here today where like where are we with this case are there suspects are we any closer there's a huge reward for tips leading to the arrest of who is responsible yeah it, it, it's kind of a complicated question i okay. mean the 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 podcast spells it out i think really well um you know the there's a lot of information to absorb um you know um it's not a case where there is no information. That's for sure. There's, there's a lot of information, but, um, over time, uh, information gets lost. Um, you know, it's, it's taught us, uh, a lot about, uh, the importance of, there are certain things that when, when somebody goes missing, um, you know, like digital information, um, should be preserved. Um, a lot of stuff gets lost very quickly. So if somebody goes missing and no one knows what's happened for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days out, a lot of that stuff is never going to be found again. Oh, man. Um, but not all of it. That's the interesting thing. So, you know, the podcast um, or, or just in general, our um, interaction with this case, my interaction with this case, it, it was very eye opening in many different ways. Refresh our memory how and why you got involved, because again... You and I chatted about this shortly after Elaine disappeared. Yeah. So Elaine's car was found uh, very close to where I live. Okay. And I had run into Neil's wife, Ingrid. You know, we're all good friends. I've known Neil forever. He, you know, wrote an article about Incubus for Rolling Stone back in like 2003 or something like that and traveled with us for like a, a week or two. Oh, wow. So I got to know him really well at that time and we just remained friends. And so Ingrid says, oh, do you hear about this girl who went missing and her car was found, you know, right, right down there on PCH. And, uh, I was just sort of like, no, like what, what, what's happening? Like what happened, you know? And she explained to me. And then I realized also that I had seen this drone search going on right before that. And I was like, Oh, that must've been what I saw. You know, there were search and rescue people and drones and they were, you know, combing the cliff sides and p divers in the water. I mean, it was like pretty intense. And so Ingrid told me that she had been talking to somebody on Facebook who was running a Facebook page where people were talking about the case and they, and it was connected with uh, Elaine's family. And so Ingrid said, I've been talking to them. They're really nice, but they need a lot of help. Maybe we could help them. And I was like, of course, like, you know, would love to be able to be helpful. Like, you know, we know lots of people in Malibu and, you know, if there was any way we could help raise awareness or whatever. So the next thing I know, we're all sitting in my living room with, you know, Elaine's wow. mom, uh, Rosemary, who was wow. running the Facebook page, uh, Jaden, who's a private investigator, and all of us were sitting together. You know, Jaden, of course, was like, you know, what the hell do you guys want? You know, like, we're not here to, like, answer questions about this case. And we were like, no, 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 of course, like, we just want to help. Like, if there's something you guys need that we can provide, you know, access to, like, maybe we could raise money, like, whatever. Like, we'll help. Right. Um, cause it was really disconcerting that somebody could just disappear a mile away from where I live. You know, it's just super weird. Malibu seemed like it should be such a safe place. It was scary that somebody could just go missing like that. And her body has never been found, correct? No, nobody's. And has anyone been arrested even for 24 hours yet? No, no one has been arrested. No. Nope. Like I said, um, over time, it's hard to recover pieces of information um, if somebody does a good enough job of covering up or or distracting or whatever it is, information gets lost. Mike, Mike, Mike. Who, whoever is responsible, one person, two people, three people, whatever, they must be having crazy anxiety that luckily Elaine Park is being talked about and in the podcast to live and die in LA in such a huge way. There's like 60 million downloads. Do you ever feel afraid that... Whoever is responsible is like F uh, Neil Strauss and Mike Einzinger. 
I mean, all we're doing is commenting on sort of what we experienced. And I don't think that that's reason enough not to, like, we want Elaine found. Yeah. That's, that's the moral of it. And, you know, we've put in, you know, probably thousands of hours of, of time and, and work, hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in expense resources and, and a reward as well. Um, Which is up to what, 250K? And you, yeah, it's 250 grand as a reward for any information leading to Elaine's whereabouts. You know, you mentioned, you know, whoever was responsible for it, exper- experiencing anxiety or whatever. Sociopaths don't do that. Okay, right. They don't give a fuck. Mm-hmm. You know, they have other motivations for what they do. So maybe that's the case here. Maybe it's not. I can't tell you today. You Does know, the police accept any tips you guys get and you say, look, We've gotten these messages. Is it cool if we just tell you some information we have that maybe you don't? Yeah, we've given a lot of information to the police. You have. Okay. You know, they don't necessarily share information with us, but we give them anything that we, anything that's of value to us, we will share with law enforcement, you know, or, you know, there's certain things also that we work on. We, we don't share anything that's not factual, you know, that's not um, like speculation in, in investigations is sometimes can be a useful thought experiment, but you know, being speculative can really lead you down the wrong path a lot. So we try and just really stick with uh, what we know and what can be confirmed. Okay. Um, it, <laughs> it's, it's a fucking crazy story. So after all the information that you have up here, real facts, is there a suspect in your mind who has not got brought in? Someone that you can definitively say, we think it's <laughs> he or she. Um, Him or her. In my own mind, um, I'll just say probably. Um, you know, it's, it's something that is a little difficult for me to talk about, but um, there's a lot of... There isn't no information. I'll just say that, you know, um, some of these sort of really hard to solve cases are like, no one knows anything. Um, this isn't one of them. This is a, a, a case that can be solved. Um, it's just a matter of time. I think. Okay. My fingers are crossed that somebody is arrested for the, for, for Elaine part. I, mean, I think, I think that, you know, Elaine's brother, Dustin, yeah. um, is like just a really, really sweet human being. And, um, you know, I care about him a lot. And um, he, he's been through a lot. And um, I think he deserves to know the truth, you know? All right. Um, I, hope, so, I hope it's found. So, I hope the truth is found soon, Mike. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. It's uh, definitely a journey, that's for sure. Okay. Um, again, that podcast is called To Live and Die in L.A. That's some serious stuff. This one's called Tuna on Toast. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mike, Incubus is about to hit the road. Innings Festival. There's going to be a couple shows in Vegas, which... That's right. There's like 82% chance I'm going to be at one of those. Whichever one you want, man. Okay, I appreciate that. And I appreciate the relationship over so many years, man. Thank you for allowing me into your world for over this time, and it's been so fun to watch all your success oh thank you and thank you for you know helping to give us a platform uh you know in the early days of incubus you know to 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 have something to talk about you know decades later you yeah, know so the, the appreciation goes both ways thank that's you, for Mike. sure thank you so yeah man much. all right the guy is a genius the guy is friendly he is successful he is mike einziger and I am Ted Stryker. And that has been our show. Thank you so much for watching. Happy snuggles. Bye-bye. Hope you enjoyed. Now hit that subscribe button. And for more Tuna on Toast, listen wherever you get your podcasts.